Welcome to the State of Music. I'm Paul John Dykes and I'm delighted today to be joined by Rab Allen from Las Vegas. Welcome to the show, Rab. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm absolutely delighted that you're joining us. i um, been a massive fan of Las Vegas for years and I'll be asking you a few questions about the kind of younger, uh, earlier days of the band. But before we do that, you've got a new album out. It's brilliant to have you guys back. Um, how's it feeling at the moment? You must be brimming with excitement to actually take this out to a live audience. Do you know what? It's been so weird because we can't do gigs. Like you always do loads of gigs around about an album and we've had singles out and different things like that. So I'm just chomping to actually go out and do some gigs. Aye. Oh, definitely. I know. This is the thing. I mean, the the world seemed to stop uh, for everybody in all different industries, but I, I did feel that the music industry was uh, kind of thrown in the scrap heap uh, in some ways, Rab. Um, it must have felt for a musician or someone in a band that this was never going to end. Do you think there's light at the end of the tunnel? I think so. I think so. I mean, the ironic thing is it took you seven years to make this record. <clears throat> I know it doesn't sound as, as though it's as good as seven years, but it took seven years to make the record and then when it was ready to be released, COVID happened and we had to kind of postpone it and stuff. So it's it's been it's just one of the things. I mean, that's gigs start to come back. I know in, in England there's gigs next week, I think, the week after and stuff. So um yeah, it's good. It's a shame for people like I don't rely on the music thing. Just like I do a million other things as well, but for people who are just relying on, on music as an income, it's like they must have really struggled. Really, really struggled. Yeah, I mean, I was speaking to a friend of mine who's involved at King Tut's and, you know, he basically had to go and find himself a job. So he was working in Tesco, has been over the whole period. And I just, I fear that there might be a generation or there might be a group, a crop of musicians who have kind of been lost and all that amazing music that they might have produced. We're going to lose that due to uh, the events that were completely out of our hands. I was yeah. reading with interest that James... Uh, was pretty busy on this album, writing, recording, engineering, producing. Um, I mean, that's some undertaking, Rab. Was that one of the reasons why it took so long? Yeah, kind of. A, I mean, we started the record in 2014. And then what had happened was we'd never took a break as a band. We'd never like had a holiday. We worked from like 2004 or five right up until 2014. And uh, James moved to Stockholm. So when he went to Stockholm, it just everything just kind of settled a wee bit for a while. And he did his thing and we all did our thing. And then uh, I met up with Alan McGee a few years later in Glasgow to get a coffee. And he was like, I want to manage your band. And I was like, well, we've already got a manager, but it kind of worked out that Alan's co-managing now. And then when that happened, then we kind of picked the album back up again and started working on it. So yeah, it was like started then, had a wee break, finished it. Was it difficult to pick it back up, Rab? Because I know that, um, you know, sometimes if you're working on something, it's it's actually hard to, to go back to that. Was that a difficulty? Did, was there ever a, a feeling that you might have just shelved that and started something new? No, because we're all quite stubborn and I think we all thought the songs were pretty good. So it was like, we've, we've got the bones of something really good here, so let's kind of work on it and kind of flesh it out. And uh, yeah, as you said, James kind of recorded it and produced it and stuff. So he had to learn, first of all, he had to learn how to carry equipment because he's never did that in his life. So he had to learn how to like, pick up amps and move amps and put mics in front of things and um, no electrocute himself and things like that. So it was quite a challenge. But I think it's it's a really good skill set that he's got because, I mean, we don't need to go in a studio and pay X crazy amount of money to record an album. He built a studio in his house and stuff. So um yeah, we're, we're really lucky, I guess. Well, I'm glad you didn't shelve the album. Um, when I've been listening to it, there was the familiarity, I think, of the, the lead single, Keep Me A Space. I, yeah. You know, I listened to that, I just thought, Glass Vegas, which is tremendous. But then there was also kind of more challenging elements of that, just as good, the epic, uh, Shake the Cage. I mean, it was veering into almost spoken word territory um, in, in uh, terms of the vocal as well. How difficult is it to... Always stay true to that Las Vegas sound, but challenge your audience as well with, with new and evolving ideas. I think that's the thing. I, I don't really think people like to be challenged these days, to be honest in music. I think people just like to hear the same kind of thing because it's familiar to their ears. So I think when we, even I, mean, even I was a bit, I don't want to use the word nervous, I was a bit apprehensive about releasing Shake the Cage because, I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you describe that to somebody? Do you know what I mean? It's like, 
it's it's a it's a difficult song, but it's one of those things. And and we could do an album of Keep My Space. We could do an album of Geraldine's. We could do an album of these things because James is capable of writing them. But we're just not that kind of band. Like we're not really make music to please other people. We're just doing it to creatively get something out. Mm. You know. And I remember the first time I held Shake the Cage, I thought James has either took a lot of drugs. <laughs> Or else, creatively, he's been in another place because how can you how can you make a song like that? Do you know what I mean? It's kind of it was kind of far out, um, and the, the demo is the, the exact same structurally and stuff as, as what you hear on the album. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess we're always kind of trying to challenge ourselves and challenge our fans, and I think that's why we've got such a good core group of fans because they want to be challenged and they want mm. to, you know, they don't want to hear the same thing over and over again. The very fact that we're talking about it means that um, that's a result. It's worked, you know, uh, we're actually talking about that because it's a standout uh, for me. You mentioned Geraldine. Now, I'm going to have to ask you something here. i seen the band back in 2007 in Dunfermline and you played Carnegie Hall and I was at that gig and um, <laughs> outside there was a wee merchandise table and the lassie told me that her name was Geraldine. Is that the Geraldine? It is the Geraldine, yeah. Actually, she she toured the whole first and second album with us, um, selling merch and basically being a babysitter <laughs> to the band. So uh, Geraldine used to work with James's sister and the two of them were social workers. Right, brilliant. And that's kind of where the song came from. Uh, she was explaining what she did one day and she was talking about how our clients, the Sparkle, would kind of leave their eyes and their souls would seem a bit of it. And that's kind of where all the lyrics came from. So... Um, actually, Geraldine was texting me last night. She was absolutely steaming, and I was supposed to meet her today for a coffee, and she had to cancel because she was so hungover. So, yeah, I'm going to embarrass her and tell you that. <laughs> that is brilliant. We'll keep that. We'll keep that in. Uh, I remember it vividly. I remember the conversation because they were brilliant. Las Vegas, probably early to her t-shirts. They were black with pink Las Vegas on them, and I actually asked, and she said that the reason for that was that pink was Johnny. Johnny Cash's favourite colour. Now, I don't know to this day if that's true, <laughs> but, it, you know, it's stuck in my mind, Rab, right? And um, great gig. I'll come back to that as well. But in the early days, you mentioned Alan McGee. I'm pretty sure I've seen a video very early doors with Alan McGee champion uh, this band called Las Vegas. He was absolutely raving about you guys. How important has he been through the whole process of Las Vegas? He has been like a cheerleader. And I mean that in a, in a, a really respectful way. Like, so he he got involved really early on. Our manager Denise met him, and uh, basically was like, "Look, you're going to love this band that I'm managing." And he was like, "All right, I'll come and see them." And we were playing in King Tut's that night, so we came down to King Tut's with Carol from the Libertines. And uh, after the gig, he was just like, "Wow, that's that was amazing." So then we just kind of kept in touch, and we kept going down to play his club nights and. Uh, he would just speak to anybody about us that would listen, really, to be honest. Um, and that kind of friendships kept up. Um, it was at my wedding and stuff. It's like that we're just we're really close. We're kind of like family now. Um, and then, as I said, he started managing the band a couple of years ago. So it's it's kind of went full circle in a way. But, um, yeah, I think having Alan on your side is always it's like having somebody in your corner, like fighting for you all the time. It's good. Absolutely. I mean, mentioning Alan McGee, you've got to mention Oasis Will I Do, because that was my, uh, you know, that was my band when I was at high school. And I, oh, incredible. I, I've heard you saying that there was a moment where you seen Oasis possibly on top of the pops, and that kind of uh, resulted in you picking up a guitar. You wanted a yeah. guitar after that. How incredible is it for that to go full circle and for the band to eventually be on the same bill as a band like Oasis or support Oasis? And were the band uh, really uh, supportive of you, Kenny, off stage? Yeah, do you know what it was? That, I mean, so that, that that was true. So I I remember Top of the Pops been on and it was uh, Don't Look Back Anger. And I, I don't like, I always had music in the house. My mum always had music on. But for some reason that just like struck a chord. And I was like, I want to learn to play guitar. So then my mum got my guitar and that's, that all kind of happened. Then we get asked to support them. Um, and that was just like, it's the only time in my life I've ever been nervous. Never been nervous meeting anybody else. Um, and the two of them were just the nicest guys. I think because we were always really nice about them in the press. We were always really like, you know, we're in a band because we love Oasis. We don't sound anything like them necessarily, but that was the thing that kind of got us into music in the first place. 
And um, every night we would play with them and like they, each of them would stand on opposite sides of the stage and um, they just never spoke to each other. And it was my birthday in, in France, we did La Berce, like a big arena thing. And uh, my mum and James's mum flew over to say happy birthday. And it was the only time I seen the two of them in the same room speaking to her, like her parents. They were just so respectful and um, whatever people think about them as guys, like they're just, yeah, they're, they're absolute sweethearts, the two of them. Oh, Brian, do you think we'll ever see them on the same stage again? Yeah. It's got to so. happen, eh? Well, it's got to happen. We, we were in tour with them when they broke up, and the hatred was real. <laughs> like, it wasn't, it, 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 it was probably a lot worse than what people actually think it was. And it's just like brothers. If you put brothers in a band together, they, they fight anyway, but mm. then put the rest of that shit in, and it's just like, I, I mean, we had the 0. 0.00001% of what they've had and I know how difficult it has been in a band so I can't even imagine what it's like but I think that I think that they've still got something to say I think there's still there's still something unfinished there for them and um but on, on, a, on a really selfish level I'm, I love both of their solo stuff so yeah. um for that for that point of view then I mean it is good having having two two different sets of music but I I, th I think it will happen at some point yeah I hope so in my lifetime when I'm not too old and grey and um, overweight to actually go and enjoy it. But we're talking about the kind of dynamics of family members being in a band. Yeah. Did, J did James get all the good football genes? We know that he's had his career with Queen's Park and Falkirk and various other teams. Yeah. Um, Gretna, yeah. were you a bit of a player yourself, Rab? I was, I was a bit of a fatty. That's what I was. I was a, I was a bit of an overweight kid who would play computer games and eat as much food as he could eat. So I never really was into anything like that. Even picking up the guitar was just like, I think my family were just surprised that I wanted to do anything other than sit on my, my bum. So um, James definitely got all the talent in, in that respect. Um, he was some player, to be honest. Like I used to go and see him and if, if he had applied himself in the way that he's applied himself to music, he could have went much higher than, than, than what he did. But I think as soon, as soon as he picked up a guitar, that was it for him. Do you know what I mean? Like his, his attention was, was was somewhere else, which luckily for me, <laughs> you know, he, he wrote a, a couple of songs that were all right after that. So, um, I, I, so no, I did not get any of the talent, the football, sports, any of that kind of, any of that kind of stuff. <laughs> I was speaking fairly recently, Rab, to Danny Lennon, who's played with James at Gretna. James and loves he, Danny. Loves yeah. Danny bits. I. <laughs> and he was raving. He was absolutely raving about him. He was raving you know, about him. You know, I've been on a night out with Danny. This was before the band. He he's a bit of a mad one as well. But I love lovely guy. Lovely guy. Like this is like many years ago. <laughs> I need to tell James. I'll tell James. He will tell me that. It's funny. Yeah, it was fairly recently. He's obviously looking after Clyde now, and he was raving about uh, James Allen, the footballer. Um, now we've mentioned a couple of the kind of earlier tracks. I'll tell you the first time I ever heard Las Vegas was MySpace, that shows you, you know, the change and the difference of the musical kind of landscape. Yep. I was being introduced to a band on MySpace. It was the demos that then I think became the home tapes, which I've got on my phone. And I was completely blown away by that. Absolutely blown away. And I remember asking James, whose idea was that? Because that was genius. And he said it was your idea. And I don't know if he was just, you know, saying that. Was that your idea to put them up on MySpace back in the day? Yeah. yeah. It was funny, like... I so I used to do the band's MySpace right. and I noticed that if bands had their songs up, it kind of made a difference to people going to see them and stuff. Cause other people were quite protective of their music and they wanted to sell their music. And I was like, nah, just put it up for free. Like just, just get away to people. And I guess even at that early stage, I, there was something in me that I was like, if we put the music up, they'll come to a gig. So I, I created, it's like a give and take thing. Do you know mm. what I mean? Rather than being like, no, if it's good enough, they'll come. I was like, no, just give, just give it to them. And what happened was we, we'd put the home tapes up and Alan McGee said, you should book a gig in King Tuts. We booked a gig in King Tuts. So this was the one after he first came to see us. So the gig Alan was at, there was like 10 people there, including him. Jim, Jim Galately was there. Alan McGee was there, Carol Barrett, and just a few other people, maybe my mum, I don't know, something like that. So Alan was like, book another gig in King Tuts. Um, and see what happens. So I put I put all the songs up in MySpace and it sold out, the gig sold out. And then I remember walking on stage being like, there's a couple of people here in there. And the, the promoter, I can't remember who it was at the time, was like, you've sold it out. 
And I was like, how, how did we manage that? Like, I always thought you sold out gigs if you had albums out and you were in the charts and that. And um, they sang every word back. And I just remember laughing. I laughed the whole gig because I was like, this is just like bizarre. <laughs> You know, when you're looking at King, I think it was a masterstroke, I've got to say, because I will get back to the, the first time I seen you live, and it was through those tracks on MySpace and sharing them amongst your pals and your brothers and all this kind of stuff. And then when you came to town, my town being Dunfermline, we just had to go and watch you. So it worked mm. absolutely brilliantly back then. But you mentioned uh, King Touch, and I just think of like musical heritage. So we've already spoken about Alan McGee, which I think is a, a massive part. He's a massive part of that. Some of my favourite bands, you know, Primal Scream, Teenage Fan Club, Jesus and Mary Chain, Oasis. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Alan McGee's name is uh, synonymous with all of that. Yeah. But King Touch is another, uh, another one of those things that as a Scottish band, it's almost like a journey and that's part of that journey. How amazing was it to, to go back once you'd had success? And play that venue again. Do you know it was amazing? So I think the last time was like 2013 we did it, and it was part of um, the Sunday Mail's charity series of concerts that they were doing. It was a guy called Mickey McMonigo. Um and we went back and did it, and it was so strange being back on the stage again. I mean, it's it's such an important place. All of those small venues are in in Scotland, like they're so important for bands because if we hadn't had access to small venues like that to practice and get better you wouldn't get bands getting big. You know, it, it takes that kind of suck at a small, small venue. So King Tuts, as you said, right, it's a heritage thing. Do you know what I mean? And it, sh it should be valued a lot more. But I think for any bands, like, and I know Manic Street Preachers went back and did it recently. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that. And that was because DF had put on one of their first gigs as well. And it's just, it's always good to kind of go back and do that. Um, yeah, and remind yourself where you've came from and those kind of things. It's nice. What well, one thing that saddens me a wee bit, I'm glad King Touch on a part of this list, Rab, is um, as a music fan or or my brother's been in bands and you look at all the different kind of milestones, King Touch being one of them, the Glasgow Barrowlands, Tea in the Park, being on the front cover of the NME, appearing on top of the Pops. There's a lot of these things that are gone forever, Rab. Is there ever, do you think, going to be a replacement for being a cover star on the NME or appearing on uh, Top of the Pops, you know, the, Tea in the Park even, it's quite sad that these things are gone forever. It is, and do you know what, it's just, that's just the way things are. Because sometimes I try and get my head around it, like things have changed so much. But the thing is, there's still value in new artists coming out. It's just that it's it's in different ways than what it was before. So like you said, that whether it was a cover of the NME or something like that, now it's, it's just a completely different thing. I'm not cool and hip and trendy enough or young enough to know what these things are, but there is, like, it's like TikTok and all these things now. It's just bizarre, like, um, but no, I, I don't think the things are ever going to come back, but I just think there'll be new things that will take over. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad to have been a part of that older guard of things because, to me, that's what I put value in. I put value in being an enemy and doing these TV shows and the festivals and stuff, and, and it was an experience. And I, f I find it I find it quite sad that a lot of these bands now don't really do a lot of gigs and don't really do the toilet circuits and don't get to experience living in a van with your mates. It's more like it's more like a pop star thing. Mm. Or stay at, you know, um, yeah. See, when you're doing these gigs, and as I say, um, Carnegie Hall and Dunfermline, beautiful, beautiful venue. I don't know if you remember that night. And I remember walking up from the car park with my all the troops that I was saying, you've got to see this band. And I spotted you, and I'm sure it was a van, and I spotted the band, and I was like, I was too scared to come over and speak to you guys. Um, but then we went in, and there was probably six bands, or maybe four or five bands playing that night, and you headlined it. And you played, it might not have been, this is maybe my mind playing tricks, I think it was the final song, was Be My Baby by The Renettes, right? Yeah, that's right. And I came away thinking, this band are going to explode. That was the moment where I thought, this band are going to explode. Had you already had that feeling yourself? Was there a moment, do you think, Rab, where you thought, this is going to happen? Do you know what there is? And I told this story a while ago, and it's a funny story. Um, so James, do you, even, even at that point, we had most of the album written, but most of the first album. Um, so it was, we, me and Paul used to pick James up to go to rehearsals, and Paul's little car had like a little Fiat crappy thing. And so every couple of months, James would go, I've got a new song, there's a CD going to put it in and tell me what you think. So we picked him up one day, he gave us a CD and he's like, I wrote this song, it's called It's Mom Cheating Heart That Makes Me Cry. He's like, I, I don't know if it's any good. So I put it in and we played it and me and Paul sitting in the front 
And I just remember thinking, we're going to get a record deal. Like, that is it. We're going to get a record deal because this is so good. And we already had Daddy's Gone and we already had Flowers and Football Tops and um, some of the other songs. But when I heard that, I was like, this is like a different a different level. And uh, the song finished and James kind of leaned in between the two seats and he was like, what do you think, boys? Is it any good? And I burst out laughing. I was like, what are you talking about? Is it any good? And uh, Paul was laughing and we just kept playing it and kept playing it and kept playing it. And that, that was when I first was like, something's going to happen. I don't know how big it's going to get, but there'll be like, there'll, there'll definitely be some level of success for the band. So. Oh, no, no doubt. I mean, when you hear songs like that, I think, you know, Daddy's Gone from that early batch of songs resonated with so many people. Um, I don't like the term crossover track, but I was speaking to people who weren't really into the same kind of music as me, but that was a song that they still took to, you know, they gravitated towards. Um, and you must have had a similar feeling when you were hearing songs like that, James coming up with things like Daddy's Gone. I mean, that and even like Flowers and Football Tops was obviously about, about the young boy Chris. Mm. Uh, been murdered and his mum's came to a few gigs and we've, we've spent some time in her company and, and it's like those are just the weird connections that happen through music that you, James thinks he's just written a song but that song's reached that woman and it's affected her and, and there's a friendship there and, and then Daddy's Gone he's written and then his dad and do you know what I mean like there was so many things that but that I think it was quite tough for James with these songs because I think the reason they resonated was because some of them are so truthful mm -hmm. And I think for him to go on stage every night and perform those songs, he was just like done in after after a gig. He was physically and mentally exhausted because it wasn't enough for him to just sing it. He had to actually mean it in the intensity. And it, it, it took a lot out of him. I think it took him quite a while to be able to kind of come to terms with that and actually do it justice without actually like leaving himself with nothing. He was an empty vessel, is what I'm trying to say. He was a bit mm. an empty vessel after gigs and... Um, yeah, yeah. See, when you were, you were talking about the kind of impact of these songs on so many different people, when people like William Shatner um, go on about sure. loving Las Vegas or uh, Lisa Marie Presley going about loving Las Vegas, that must feel a bit surreal. Um, you know, having gone through this this kind of process, as you say, getting picked up in the wee motor and going to uh, band practice and, you know, James writing tunes, is this any good? To Before you know it, these household names are saying, you know, we dig Las, Las Vegas. Do you know what? This happened so many times, right? So, again, before we signed a record deal, so we signed a record deal in 2008. So see, about the time we must have had Carnegie Hall, we were going into rehearsals in Glasgow. We'd rehearsed and on the way back, James's phone rang. And he was like, I don't recognise the number. And they answered it. And he was like, hello. And you could hear whatever. And James was like, oh, fuck off. And he hung up. And the phone rang again. And James was like, who is it? And he's like, oh, it's a guy kidding on his Rick Rubin. If he had Def Jam Records or whatever it's called. And we were like, answer it again. And he answered it. And the guy's like, no, it's really me. Like, I want, I want to work for the band. And at this point, we'd never left Glasgow. So this, so Rick Rubin had got James's phone number from like Muse or Radiohead or so there was some some mad connection. Like he had heard the home tapes in LA. So these tapes that James has recorded in a bedroom in, in Shettleson have made their way to like LA to like this guy who's worked with Johnny Cash and all these people. And it was just like that happened so many times that like you would get a phone call. Like the I was talking about Ian McCulloch earlier to you for Echo and the Bunnyman. So the first time we did Jules Holland, um the next day, me and James were out in London. We were out for a beer, and James's phone went, and it was like Mac, and he's like, "All right, lad." He's like, "This is uh, Ian Feck and the Bunny Man. I just want to say that I think you're the best thing I've ever seen in Joe's Holland." He was like, "You reminded me of Kurt Cobain," and James was like, "I don't know if it's really him or not." He was like, "I think something's winding me up," and that used to happen a lot. That you would just get like, and then obviously like Oasis and all these different people saying they love the band, and it was just like. It was it was a bit of, it was a bit of head fuck to be honest as well like trying to trying to come to terms with that kind of level of um, people liking your 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 art and your thing because we're all really working class we all come for the East End really normal upbringings to go from like that to being given loads of money and loads of people loving your band it was it was a bit of it's a bit of a head fuck, to be honest. <laughs> Can you see, Rab, sometimes why, and I, I, I don't mean it goes to people's head, but people can't actually deal with that. We spoke about football before, you know, young young guys getting that success after years of hard work. Can you see why it's very difficult to actually deal with that fame and the fortune, the adulation? Oh, I, I mean, I lost the plot. Like, I've spoken about it a few times. I totally, I totally derailed 
and it was like um it's not because and, and it's a really hard thing to explain to people because when somebody gives you hundreds of thousands of pounds and you're doing your dream job and you're selling out all your gigs but you're really unhappy how can you explain that to somebody when it's like all your dreams have came true mm. um and it took me it took me a long time to figure out what was going on and why it was happening uh so it's dead easy for me to speak about it now but it was just at the time it was just like yeah, it was such a weird thing, and then obviously now we, it's it's becoming a, a lot more common for people to speak in the football footballing thing as well. Such an important part, um, and I kind of understand why that is. It's just like it's just good that people start to speak about it, and it's it's starting to get a bit of attention um, because people just don't talk enough. I always like, think about the the music industry. Um, and these people are on the TV, and you see them on a stage. It's like you say, you would never think that all all the success that they're having is having a detrimental effect at any point. Uh, but being on the road must play a part in that as well, not having the kind of home comforts and just, the, you know, the normality of a home life wrap. How difficult was that in the early days? In the early days, it, it was, it was, wasn't too bad because you're doing it with your best mates. So there is that kind of familiarity thing there that you've, I mean, we were like a gang, like, and we still are, it's that kind of mentality. So we're all really, really close. I think the touring thing started to get really difficult when it was like you were away from home for like 300 days of the year without a break. That was like when things started getting really difficult, when it was constant gig, constant gig, constant gig. You would be that exhausted. You would take something to get you through the day, take it on mm -hmm. to the next day, thinking, well, it'll be fine because I'll get a rest at this point. But the rest never came. And like they're giving you like... Every night, you would have like 100 beers in your dressing room. You'd have a bottle of Jack, a bottle of vodka. Every night, the booze was getting finished. Do you know what I mean? So it's that that was the side of touring that was difficult. But I don't think I would be here if I hadn't did it with that group of people. And if like I was, I've said about Geraldine, if Geraldine wasn't there, I think she was like a plant. I think she was put there to kind of look after us. And it's something we've never really spoke about, but I think she was like genuinely... She was kind of put in there just to make sure everything was okay. Because um, it could have went really wrong. And I've seen it mm. go really wrong with other bands as well. And that's always my greatest, uh, I feel like that's my greatest achievement, that the band still got on, we're all best mates, and we're all alive. <laughs> to be honest. It's, and, it's incredible. Know. It's incredible. I look at the very first band i ever seen live, and I know they're not that cool and trendy now, but it was in the early 90s and it was you too. And I know that you've supported you too. And I always think it's incredible that they guys have stuck together for as long as they have done. I mean, that's almost unheard of. It's, you know, it's, it, it is unheard of. I mean, we, we've been in a band now for maybe 25 years, 26 years or something like that. Is it that long? No, it must be about 20 years. I mean, they've been doing it for at least 40, 45. That is just like... It's insane. Like, I know, and for the amount of success, do you know what, you, you two is another one, that they're, they're the nicest bunch of people. I know they get a hard time, right? But it's like, it's the stuff that people don't hear about. It's like, whenever they come to Glasgow, they phone a manager and they say, does the band want to come down and meet us and hang out before the gig? Right? Oh, yeah. They don't need to do that. Do you know what I mean? They've got a million other things that, that they need to be doing, but they're always like, do you, do you want to bring the band in and we can, we can hang out and stuff? It's like... But nobody speaks about that kind of stuff. People speak to, speak about Bono being an arse and all these things. And the stories I could tell about Bono, it's just like he's just as insecure as anybody else. Mm -hmm. They make music, you know. It's just, uh, it's, it's a shame. I, and I, I, I love them. I, I think you two are great. They're, they're one of my favourite bands. It was that tune, baby, that really uh, caught fire for me. That was the the beginning of my love affair with you two. Uh, and believe it or not, the first time I seen them, Rab, was at Celtic Park. So, um, well, I, I remember that night because yeah. I, was, I was in James's. James used to start, uh, live in Greenfield and we could hear the gig from Greenfield because it was so loud at Celtic Park and I remember that night, it was a nice night when the gig was <laughs> on. Um, yeah, that's mad, I can remember that. It was probably the best thing that was happening at Celtic Park around about that time, to be honest with you, Rab, in the early 1990s. Um, but a very memorable gig. It's great to hear that, though, getting that insight into the fact that they're human beings, they're normal guys, and actually they're decent. I mean, that's yeah. great to hear, you know? They are, they are, they are totally decent. They, they do loads for, for like small upcoming bands, but they just don't promote that they do it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? They, they, and they, yeah, yeah. Nice guys. 
You're talking there about some of the, the kind of stresses that we don't see as fans uh, when the band is, is on this kind of wave of success. Mm. Is there that added pressure when you're on a major as well on the second album? A lot of bands struggle to follow up the success of a debut. Um, and I mean, I, I've been a fan, as I say, of Las Vegas all the way through. And I think when, you, when you're in, you're in when it comes to music. It's like what you were saying earlier about the Gallaghers. I've, I'm still buying all the solo stuff because, yeah. you know, they struck a chord in 1994. Um, but when it comes to that second album, there's a huge pressure on the band to, to deliver something uh, coming up to the same kind of sales, etc. As, as the first album. I don't really think we thought about that at the time. I think we were just like in the middle of that bubble that was just like a party bubble that we were just having a good time. Um, and I think... I mean, a, a, wee, a wee bit of backstory with the, with the record label. The record label absolutely detested us, specific people that were high up, because they just couldn't control us. Mm -hmm. Because we, within our contract, we had final say on everything. Absolutely everything. There was not one thing, because every single label wanted to sign us. So they had to give us that kind of freedom. And it was just like, they would just try and get us to do these things as we were selling our souls. And we, were just, we just wouldn't do the, we wouldn't play the big corporate game and we lost out on so much because of that, but at least I can sleep at night knowing that I, you know, I was totally true to myself. Whereas there's other bands, and I'm not going to name who they are, but there's other big bands that play arenas who come across getting at the big hard man, who get their asses slapped and get told about today, and there's somebody's bitch, and and that's fine if you accept that. Do you know what I mean? But we we just can't really be any other way. So when it came to the second record. Uh, they were, they could not wait to get rid of us. <laughs> they could yeah. not wait. Oh my God, it was like, and the, the funny thing was that the, the album went top 10 and they dropped us the week the album came out. <clears throat> and it went top 10. Who would they want a top 10 album? But we, like, we we knew it was coming. But the good thing with the, the, good thing with the, the record label was that, again, it was signed into your contract that, that it didn't matter how much money we owed them. If they dropped us, the money was written off. So it was like, we totally fucked them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Fair, the thing fair is, play. Fair play to you, Rob. Honestly, but the thing is, that I need to say that there were some really good people that worked at the label and some really good people that worked with us who totally disagreed with the way that it was ran as well. But being on Columbia was one of the best experiences I could have had because it got us out to so many people mm. and exposed us to so many different things. And I got to go around the world like a million times and just culturally it was like phenomenal. Um, but in terms of that second record, I, I, did, I don't really think it would have mattered what we did. As soon as James wrote a song about somebody being gay, they just didn't know what to do with that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I remember when they were in the studio and they heard I Feel Wrong, you could just see eyeballs looking as though we don't know what to do with this, so how can we sell this? And and again, that's the thing I was saying. Like, we were quite proud of that because it's like, we, don't, we, we, we didn't want to make the first record again because that's just boring. You know I mean, what, what it's funny, what Alan McGee said was, Alan McGee said was, your second album should have been your fifth. Like, you're meant to kind of incrementally change mm -hmm. your sound and change your thing, but you just kind of jumped forward five albums. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm still really proud of the second record. It's one of my favourites, to be honest. Um, I think song-wise, I think the songs are better songs than the first record. I just don't think they connected with people because it was a bit harder for them to connect with in terms of what the songs are about. Um, mm. But yeah, I went to my rant now, but yeah, I think you, you get the point of what I'm, what I'm saying. Oh, definitely. There was a, a real change in the landscape in music as well. You know, when you look at what else was coming out around about that time, yeah. you know, music had changed dramatically uh, since yeah. the first album had come out as well, Rab. Um, but you spoke there about the fact that you kept the money, and that's great, because I know a friend of mine, Edgar Jones from Liverpool, we were talking about Liverpool before, he was in a band, that he played bass for Ian McCulloch, actually. Um, but Edgar, his band, The Stairs, were kind of ripped off by the record label in that respect. That they were they were due them a lot of money after the the first album when they were dropped. Um, so w when you then plan a return, uh, because I mean, eight years seems like a long time, but a lot's happened. And as you say, the, the album's been there or thereabouts for mm. for some time. And I'm talking about three years being a massive time from first to second album. Eight years seems like a lifetime, but you've got more control of it now, haven't you? Because you're releasing the record yourself. Exactly. I mean, so we basically paid to make the record. We paid to do everything because then we make every single penny that comes back in. So the way it works for a lot of bands now, like especially bands signed to majors, is that they give them 
live money, they give them money for their merchandise, they give them money from absolutely everything. We're in a position where we keep every single penny from everything. So we, we, we run the band like a business and I hate talking like that. And James doesn't really get that involved because he's more like the kind of creative one, but it's, it, it's good the way that we're doing it because we just, we are in control of everything. So we, we design the artwork, we design the merch, we choose which gigs to play, we choose which gigs not to play. It's, uh, I, th I think because we're all a wee bit older, it's just the easiest way to do it. Mm -hmm. What do you think of St. Luke's as a venue? I loved it. I loved mm -hmm. it. So we, we, did the, we did the live stream there and it was, a, it was a really difficult day. So many things went wrong. But um, I, as, as a venue, I've seen a few bands and I've seen Camera Obscura in it a few years ago, one of my favourite bands, and I, I absolutely loved it. Um, I would love to do like a few nights in it, like actual gigs. Mm -hmm. Um, at some point, but, um, yeah, but it's a beautiful venue. I, I like churches or something about playing in churches. It's really nice. Yeah, definitely. That time you played at uh, Carnegie, and I'm going to have to bring this up again. I'm pretty sure. Again, it might have been the over the over the period I've made this up in more mind wrap, but I'm pretty sure that when I saw you at the van, there was a bottle of Buckfast making a guest appearance. Now, there oh, was no. nothing. Possibly more. Um, there's not. I've nothing against it. And in actual fact, in the studio fridge, and I keep saying this, there is a bottle in that studio fridge just in case anybody wants to partake um, if they ever visit us. Uh, what is it with Buckfast and uh, the Scottish palate? Why does it match so well? Do you know what? My wife hates me drinking it. She won't <laughs> let me drink in the house. So I shouldn't really be saying that she tells me what to do, but she does, right? So I don't, the main reason I started drinking it was because it's got more caffeine in it than Red Bull, right? That's a genuine reason. So before gigs, we used to have a glass of it because it used to kind of pick us up because we were always quite tired. We'd been doing interviews all day and that kind of stuff. And then it's just something that's kind of stuck and like, I always drink it at gigs now. Like I think when last time we did the bar as a promoter, I got like a buck fast, like, uh, uh, like a basket and you know, you get like hampers, it was like a buck fast hamper. <laughs> um, and like whenever we go and tour in the UK, I'm always on my phone trying to find out where, where can I get booked fast in Manchester, London, and normally the promoter tries to get it. But it is quite a distinct Scottish thing, although it's massive in Ireland as well. Right. So, um, and I've been to Buckfast Abbey. I've been down and visited my my, my brothers down in the Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Superb. Oh yeah. I, I, I love it. So Good. Good. Do you drink it... Um out the fridge? Is it chilled? Yes, yeah, yeah. chilled. Um, but if it's not chilled, that's fine. I'm no, I'm not that fussy. Um, yeah, not, not normally I have it like a bottle of gig. That's usually what happens. And then normally at some point during the gig, I'll start pouring it for people in the crowd, and then they'll start drinking it as well. And, yeah, and, anything more than a bottle, and I think you're going into kind of dangerous territory there, Rab. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I certainly would be. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, I know you're working on your your PhD. And yeah. I'm always looking for up and coming Scottish acts. How healthy is the Scottish music scene at the moment, do you think, Rob? I think it's probably the best it's been in a while. Um, I mean, there's not really been like a scene in a while, I don't think. Um, and I, I think that's kind of starting to change. I think the, the Say Award and the SMIA have probably had a hand in that um, by promoting Scottish music, especially new Scottish music. Um, and that's how I've discovered a, a load of new bands from Scotland. But I mean, even even just now, there's there's bands like Lucia and the Best Boys. I think is one of the best bands going about. Um, Walk Disco. Um, who else? Dead Pony. I think are incredible. They're like ABBA. It's like a two piece version of ABBA. It's a girl singer, but they're incredible. I mean, there's just there's so many good bands. I always do this, and I forget some. Uh, a band called Freakwave, who our manager actually manages as well. They're fantastic. Um, I just think it's it's really healthy. But it's really interesting, as you said, because I'm doing the PhD, I'm having to look at the whole thing. Mm -hmm. the whole, so basically what I'm doing is I'm mapping and measuring the Scottish music industry. So I'm looking to see where there's value within the industry, where there's gaps and where they could generate more value. Um, so... Yeah, that's it is the bane of my life just now. I'm, I'm about a year and a half into it. And I've got like blocks and like notepads lying everywhere with all these notes and stuff because I just had a meeting someday. Anyway, um 
But yeah, I, I think the overall industry is is in really good shape. That's the other thing I have to do. I have to come up with what the overall worth of the music industry in Scotland is financially, like in economic terms. So um, it, is, it is in good shape, even though it's a small country and it, it's not got the best infrastructure. There is parts of it that are, that are really worth singing its praises. No, it's great to hear that. Um, as I say, we do bring a, a, as many Scottish acts in, into the studio as we possibly can along with that continue. There seems to be a real buzz around West Lothian at the moment, so that's that's tremendous. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, Tell us, where are we going to be able to see you live with your new album um, to a live audience? When are the dates uh, being rescheduled to? So you're putting me on the spot here. My manager's going to give me a hard time because I don't have the dates. So we will be, we're playing, we're doing the UK... Uh, we're doing a UK tour in February next year, mm-hmm. and we're supposed to be doing Europe in March. That's just not been announced yet. Um, we are. We've got some festivals uh, this year. We're doing a festival in Edinburgh in August. Is it East out 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 there East? I think it's called. I can't remember the name of it. That's that's really bad. And we are doing um, the Playground Festival, and is it Recruiting Glen Park in Glasgow in September? Right. Um, so that's got to be amazing. It's uh, the Labertines are headlining, the band James and us. So that's like some lineup. That's got to be amazing. So, and we've got some other wee bits and bobs happening here and there. But um, the guys in Glasgow is in SWG3 in February next year. Tremendous venue again. I was in the Poetry Club. Uh, just uh, about two years ago, watching. Is that a small one, is that yeah, the one? yeah, yeah. That's um, Jim Lambie's place. It's beautiful actually because everything in it looks like a work of art, yeah. which is obviously Jim's uh, influence. But again, I seen Edgar Jones, Edgar Summertime Jones playing there. It was tremendous. So great that uh, more music venues are coming to the fore in Scotland. Rab, I'm a massive fan of Las Vegas. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me on A State of Music and I look forward to seeing that album being played to a live audience. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me.